is as a gum which oozes from whence it is nourished. The fire of the flint shows not till it be struck. Our gentle flame provokes itself, and like the current flies each bound it chafes. In these lines, spoken by a minor character, a poet, in one of Shakespeare's less familiar plays, Timon of Athens, he conjures up a brilliant, partly ironical image of the poetic process. The fire of Shakespeare's poetry was struck from the flint of circumstance. That's to say, he was a hard-working, prolific writer of plays, well over 30 plays in 20 years, whose genius was harnessed to producing successful public entertainments. His sonnets and other non-dramatic poems, such as Venus and Adonis, are great, certainly, but the only proper way to represent his genius in miniature is to show it in action in the plays. And this is what we've tried to do in this program, by plucking out a few short moments in the greatest plays to show in chronological order his variety over the years in many moods. Though he began as a writer of history plays, he also wrote both tragedies and comedies pretty early, probably by the time he was 30. Already in Romeo and Juliet, he combines both. This story of family feud and passionate young love is relieved and lightened as soon as Juliet's nurse appears. Even or odd, of all days of the year, come Lammas Eve at night shall she be fourteen. Susan and she, God rest all Christian souls, where of an age. Well, Susan is with God, she was too good for me. But as I said, come Lammas Eve at night shall she she be fourteen, that shall she marry. I remember it well. Tis since the earthquake now, eleven years, and she was weaned. I never shall forget it of all days of the year upon that day. For I had then laid wormwood to my dug, sitting in the sun under the dove house wall. My lord and you were then in Mantua. Nay, I do bear a brain, but as I said, when it did taste the wormwood on the nipple of my dug and felt it bitter pretty fool to see it fetch it and fall out with the dug. Shake quoth the dove house. There was no need I try to bid me trudge. And since that time, it is eleven years. For then she could stand high low. Nay, by the root, she could have run and waddled all about. For even the day before, she broke her brow. And then my husband... God be with the soul of us, a merry man, took up the child. Yea, <laughs> quoth he, dost thou fall upon thy face? Thou wilt fall backward when thou hast more wit. Wilt thou not, Jew? And by my halogen, the pretty wretch left crying and said, Aye, to see now how a jest should come about. I warrant that I should live a thousand years. I never should forget it. Wilt thou not, Jew? quoth he. And pretty fool, it's tinted and said, <laughs> yes, madam, but I cannot choose but laugh to think it should leave crying and say, <laughs> And yet I warrant it had upon its brow a bump as big as a young cockerel stone, a perilous knock, and it cried bitterly. <laughs> yet, quoth my husband, falls upon thy face, thou wilt fall backward when thou hast more wit, wilt thou not choose. And said, I. Peace, I have done. God mark thee to his grace. Thou wast the prettiest babe that e'er I nursed. And I might live to see thee married once. I have my wish. Shakespeare's theatre, the Elizabethan theatre, 
wasn't a place in which realism could be easily established. Often open to the sky with very simple props and without any of the illusionary tricks we've grown used to in the modern theater and indeed in films and on television, words had to do most of the work in setting the scene, for example. This is a problem Shakespeare tackles head on in his opening chorus to Henry V. Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention, a kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. Then should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment. But pardon, gentles all, the flat, unraised spirits that have dared on this unworthy scaffold to bring forth so great an object. Can this cockpit hold the vasty fields of France? Or may we cram within this wooden O the very casks that did affright the air at Agincourt? Oh, pardon, since a crooked figure may attest in little place a million, and let us ciphers to this greater compte on your imaginary forces work. Suppose within the girdle of these walls are now confined two mighty monarchies whose high uprearied and abutting fronts the perilous narrow ocean parts asunder. Peace out our imperfections with your thoughts. Into a thousand parts divide one man and make imaginary puissance. Think when we talk of horses that you see them printing their proud hoofs in the receding earth. For it is your thoughts that now must deck our kings, carry them here and there, jumping over times, turning the accomplishment of many years into an hourglass. For the which supply, admit me chorus to this history, who, prologue-like, your humble patience pray, gently to hear, kindly to judge our play. Among Shakespeare's twelve comedies, Twelfth Night has always been one of the most popular. But in fact, what's sometimes forgotten is that particularly in the comedies, and most of all in Twelfth Night and Much Ado, some of the best and most characteristic Shakespeare is written in prose. But one of the most delicate scenes in Twelfth Night shows his verse at its gentlest. The moment when Viola, in her male disguise as Cesario, is left with the Duke Orsino and obliquely suggests her love for him. Once more, Cesario, get thee to yon same sovereign cruelty. Tell her my love, more noble than the world, prizes not quantity of dirty lands. The parts that fortune hath bestowed upon her, tell her I hold as giddily as fortune. But tis that miracle and queen of gems that nature pranks her in, attracts my soul. But if she cannot love you, sir? I cannot be so answered. Sooth, but you must. Say that some lady, as perhaps there is, hath for your love, as true a pang of heart as you have for Olivia. You cannot love her. You tell her so. Must she not then be answered? There is no woman's sides can bide the beating of so strong a passion as love doth give my heart. No woman's heart so big to hold so much, they lack retention. Alas, their love may be called appetite. No motion of the liver but the palate that suffers surfeit, cloyment and revolt. Mine is all as hungry as the sea and can digest as much. Make no compare between that love a woman can bear me and that I owe Olivia. I, but I know. What dost thou know? Too well what love women to men may owe. In faith they are as true of heart as we. My father had a daughter loved a man. As it might be, perhaps, were I a woman, I should your lordship. And what's her history? A blank, my lord. She never told her love, but left concealment, like a worm in the bud feed on her damask cheek. She pined in thought, and with a green and yellow melancholy, she sat like patience on a monument, smiling at grief. Was not this love indeed? We men may say more, swear more, but indeed our shows are more than will, for still we prove much in our vows, but little in our love. But died thy sister her love, my boy? 
I am all the daughters of my father's house. And all the brothers, too. And yet I know not. Sir, shall I to this lady? Aye, that's the theme. To her in haste, give her this jewel. Say, my love can give no place, bide no delay. Shakespeare wrote his five or six greatest tragedies in the early years of the 17th century. Of them all, it's probably Hamlet that has most haunted the imagination of the world, particularly in the soliloquies. As when Hamlet sits alone, brooding on his father's death and his mother's or a hasty marriage. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew. Or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self slaughter. Oh, God, God, how weary, stale, flat and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. Fie on ah, fie, it is an unweeded garden that grows to seed. Things rank and gross in nature possess it merely. That it should come to this. But two months dead, nay, not so much, not two. So excellent a king that was to this Hyperion to a satyr. So loving to my mother that he might not be teen, the winds of heaven visit her face too roughly. Heaven and earth must I remember why she would hang on him as if increase of appetite had grown with what it fed on. Yet within a month, let me not think on it. Frailty, thy name is woman. A little month, or ere those shoes were old with which she followed my poor father's body like Niobe, all tears. Why, she, even she, oh God, a beast that wants discourse of reason would have mourned longer, married with mine uncle. My father's brother, but no more like my father than I to Hercules, within a month. Ere yet the salt of most unrighteous tears had left the flushing in her galled eyes, she married. Oh, most wicked speed to post with such dexterity to incestuous sheets. It is not, nor it cannot come to good. But break my heart, for I must hold my tongue. Some of the most poignant moments in Shakespeare are moments of recognition or reconciliation. Moments when conflict is resolved or misunderstanding becomes understanding. Such moments seem to come particularly in the later plays, but not only in the late romances. Earlier, there's the scene in King Lear at the end of Act Four, when Cordelia, Lear's estranged daughter, speaks to him as he slowly emerges from humiliation and madness cast out by his other cruel daughters into the storm. He wakes. Speak to him. Madam, do you? Tis fittest. How does my noble lord? How fares your majesty? You do me wrong to take me out of the grave. Thou art a soul in bliss. I am bound upon a wheel of fire, and mine own tears do scald like molten lead. Sir, do you know me? You are a spirit, I know. When did you die? Still, still, far wide. He's scarce awake. Let him alone a while. Where have I been? Where am I? Fair daylight. I am mightily abused. I should even die with pity to see another thus. <laughs> I know not what to say. I will swear these are my hands. Let's see. I feel this pinprick. Would I were assured of my condition. Oh, look upon me, sir. And hold your hand in benediction or... No, sir. You must not kneel. Pray, do not mock me. I am a very foolish, fond old man. 
four score and upward, not an hour more or less. And to deal plainly, I fear I am not in my perfect mind. But thinks I should know you and know this man. Yet I am doubtful, for I am mainly ignorant what place this is. And all the skill I have remembers not these garments. Nor I know not where I did lodge last night. Do not laugh at me. For as I am a man, I think this lady to be my child, Cordelia. And so I am. I am. Be your tears wet. Yes, Faith. I pray you weep not. If you have poison for me, I will drink it. I know you do not love me. For your sisters have, as I do remember, done me wrong. You have some cause. They have not. No cause. No cause. Am I in France? In your own kingdom, sir. Do not abuse me. Be comforted, good madam. The great rage, you see, is killed in him. And yet it is danger to make him o'er the time he has lost. Desire him to go in. Trouble him no more. Till further settling. Will it please your highness? Walk. You must bear with me. Pray you now. Forget and forgive. I am old and foolish. Some of Shakespeare's finest, most memorable speeches are given to minor characters. In Antony and Cleopatra, Enobarbus, one of Mark Antony's friends, is in many ways a comic character, certainly a lightweight one. As with the majority of Shakespeare's less serious figures, most of the time he speaks in prose, but there's an extraordinary passage in which, describing Cleopatra's meeting with Antony to one of Caesar's companions, Enobarba suddenly surprises us with a vivid, sensuous, and at the same time slightly mocking speech in verse. The barge she sat in like a burnished throne burned on the water. The poop was beaten gold. Purple the sails and so perfumed that the winds were lovesick with them. The oars were silver, which to the tune of flutes kept stroke, and made the water, which they beat, to follow faster, as amorous of their strokes. For her own person, it beggared all description. She did lie in her pavilion, cloth of gold of tissue, or picturing that Venus where we see the fancy outworked nature. On each side of her stood pretty dimpled boys like smiling cupids with divers colored fans whose wind did seem to glow the delicate cheeks which they did cool and what they undid did. Oh, rare for Antony. Her gentle women like the Nerides, so many mermaids, tended her the eyes and made their bends adorning. At the helm, a seeming mermaid steers the silken tackle, swell with the touches of those flower-soft hands that yearly frame their office. From the barge, a strange, invisible perfume hits the sense of the adjacent walls. The city cast her people out upon her. And Anthony, his thrown to the marketplace, did sit alone, whistling to the air, which but for vacancy had gone to gaze on Cleopatra too, and made a gap in nature. Rare Egyptian. Upon her landing, Antony sent to her, invited her to supper. She replied it should be better he became her guest, which he entreated. Our courteous Antony 
who ne'er the word of no woman heard speak, being barbered ten times o'er, goes to the feast and for his ordinary pays his heart for what his eyes eat only. Loyal wench, she made great Caesar lay his sword to bed. He ploughed her and she cropped. I saw her once hop forty paces through the public streets, and having lost her breath, she spoke and panted that she did make defect perfection and breathless power brief or now Antony must leave her utterly. Never. He will not. Age cannot wither her, nor custom stale her infinite variety. Other women cloy the appetite they feed, but she makes hungry where most she satisfies. For vilest things become themselves in her that the holy priest bless her when she is riggish. Songs play a significant part in Shakespeare's verse. Very often songs which sum up or comment ironically on a theme in a drama. Or a song may sometimes serve as a moment of punctuation. As in one of his last plays, Cymbeline, when the two princes pronounce a dirge or funeral song over the supposedly dead body of their sister Imogen. Fear no more the heat of the sun nor the furious winter's rages, thou thy worldly task hast done. Home art gone, and ta'en thy wages. Golden lads and girls all must, as chimney sweepers come to dust. Fear no more the frown of the great, thou art past the tyrant's stroke. Care no more to clothe and eat, to thee the reed is as the oak. Scepter, learning, physic, must all follow this and come to dust. Fear no more the lightning flash. Nor the all-dreaded thunderstone. Fear not slander, censure rash. Thou hast finished joy and moan. All, all lovers, lovers young, all, all lovers, lovers must consign to thee and come to dust. dust. No exorciser harm thee. Nor no witchcraft charm thee. Ghost unlaid forbear thee. Nothing ill come near thee. Quiet, Quiet consummation have, and, and renowned be thy grave. Though Shakespeare didn't die until the year 1616, when he was 52, he probably wrote the last play that was wholly his own work, rather than a part work like Henry VIII, five years earlier. His final play, The Tempest, seems a true epilogue to that busy 20-year-long career, a coda hinting at themes he'd used before and resolving them into a pure and serene work of the imagination. Prospero, the all-powerful magician, renounces his magic and gives up his art. To many people it has seemed an image of Shakespeare himself, making his own farewell to his craft and to his own magic. Ye elves of hills, brooks, standing lakes and groves, and ye that on the sands with printless foot do chase the ebbing Neptune and do fly him when he comes back, you demi puppets that by moonshine do the green sour ringlets make whereof the ewe not bites, and you whose pastime is to make midnight mushrumps that rejoice to hear the solemn curfew, by whose aid Weak masters though ye be, I have bedimmed the noontide sun, brought forth the mutinous winds, and twixt the green sea and the azured vaults at roaring war. To the dread rattling thunder have I given fire, and by the spurs plucked up the pine and cedar. Graves at my command have waked their sleepers, oped and let them forth by my so potent art. But this rough magic, I hear abjure, and when I have required some heavenly music, which even now I do, to work mine end upon their senses that this airy charm is for, I'll break my staff, bury it certain fathoms in the earth, 
and deeper than did ever plummet sound, I'll drown my book.